Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of Ask GMBN Tech. Now, if you're at home and you've got a question, get in the comments below using the hashtag AskGMBNTech, and hopefully we can feature it on the show. Now, apologies this week, I'm a bit ill. I've got an absolutely monstrous head cold, which I can ensure you wasn't a result of overindulging over Christmas, but bear with me and I will try, well, let's try and get some sense out of me. Let's give it a bloody good go. So the first question is from The Dean and they ask, is there regular maintenance that needs to be done on cool shocks? Now, I'm assuming here you mean coil shocks and not shocks that just go around with ripped jeans or something, coil shocks. And if so, is there a guide on performing it? Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're very right. There is a large difference in the needs of a coil shock or an air shock. Air shocks need to have more regular services in order to keep their seals running smooth and not damaging that large diameter shaft. Coil shocks largely run a bit more maintenance free. When you service them, you do a full service. You go, you basically service the damper because the spring, in this case, a coil spring instead of an air spring is sitting externally to the shock. But what things are there to look out for? Well, first thing you need to make sure that your um, shaft isn't collecting, you know, huge amounts of debris on it. It's not just sitting there really dirty. It's got no chips or scars or anything like that. Um, a big thing to look for on a coil shock is actually just inspecting the spring. Make sure it's not wobbling loose and also make sure that, well, as a spring is compressed, it can flex a little bit. And sometimes that flexing can crack and, um, and remove paint from the coil itself. So it's really worth being sure, especially at the ends of the shock, that they're not beginning to corrode because that paint has flaked off and then they're beginning to rust. So giving them a quite quick wipe down is, um, yeah, is a surefire bet to stop that. But they are a lot easier to maintain, I would say, than your air shocks. So next up, we have a question from Andre. And he says, hi guys, I'm looking at getting my first full suspension bike. And I was wondering why some shocks are more vertical and some are more horizontal. What are the advantages and disadvantages of each type? What would you recommend for an all round trail bike? Well, there's no definitive right answer on this. You're seeing more and more shocks come with that vertical shock mounting, a la it looks like a Trek session. Now, this is for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a good way to incorporate a four bar um, in a very popular way. And what it means is that instead of having to reinforce the top tube or the down tube, to put that shock mount in there. You can actually do it on an area of the frame that is already, already heavily reinforced, the bottom bracket shell. So that can kind of save you weight by not having to add it other places. That shock mounting also lends itself quite well on a trailer enduro bike to fitting in a water bottle gauge. So that's the benefit. But the kinematics of a shock are really, really, you know, it's, it's not something landed on by accident. And the way the kinematics of a shock is derived is because each part of that linkage is acting like a lever. And how you position the shock, something like the Nuteproof Mega, the reason they have it in that orientation is because they're so particular about the characteristics they want from their suspension. And they don't feel they could get it any other way. And it's that. So it's not that one side prioritizes anything more than others. I think most bike designers, especially in years past, on your long travel bikes, have put the characteristics of the suspension first, and then where the shock actually ends up is kind of, you know, coincidental. And then they try and design other parts of the bike around it. Um, it is becoming more and more common that bikes kind of have to have a bottle cage or kind of it's looking like that um, and it's more of a selling feature now. I personally really do like a bottle cage on my bike. Um, and I think it's another design challenge. Another thing to note is that if you want to have a fully floating linkage, so the shock floats at the bottom as well as the top, then that would normally lend itself to a vertical system. But honestly, there is not one better than the other. It's just, um, it's just a choice the engineers make when they're putting the bike together. Okay, so next question is from Lewis Turner. And he says, how could bike handling be affected if you had only one carbon wheel, either on the front or the back? So firstly, let's look at how a carbon wheel can feel different to an alloy wheel. But before we answer that question, I wanna be clear. 
there are so many different types of wheel made with alloy and so many different types of wheel made with carbon. I'm gonna talk in general terms here. I'm not gonna talk about specific models because, well, I think it's a bit of a minefield. Um, largely, the trend or the, sorry, the associated thinking around carbon wheels is they can be stiffer in terms of your side to side um, and with a kind of new wave of carbon wheels coming through, they can also give a lot of vertical compliance. Now, why do you want a wheel to be stiff in terms of side to side? Well, think about your high load turns when you're really turning on a dime. Imagine, you know, the example I would use when you're insiding a berm or hitting a catch berm. Your direction is suddenly changing, you know, in a very short distance. Now, because normally the forces going through the bike when that happens are more severe on the back of the bike, on the rear wheel, I would say that having a stiff rear wheel, i.e. via higher spoke tension or a choice of material, is gonna give you a more stable feeling in those turns. Conversely, if you have that very stiff wheel on the front, sometimes it can be fatiguing, especially on your hands. But it's not really fair for me to say because, I mean, I would cite one example, even though I said I wasn't going to. Those new zip wheels are made without using a box section. So essentially what it means is they're very vertically compliant. So on a front wheel, that would be perfect. So I know I'm not giving you a really black and white answer here because it's a very complicated question. The reason I can't recommend wholeheartedly is slapping a carbon rim on the back is that elephant in the room, carbon can sometimes be known to break under high impacts. And when you do have more of your weight on the rear wheel and you hit something really hard, either at high speed or just a, you know, a really harsh compression, you could just basically break the rim. So it depends on you, on your riding style, on your riding location. There are so many variables. So um, I would say it's probably gonna give a better performance increase on the rear, but there are so many variables that I can't wholeheartedly say that's the definitive answer. Next, we have a question from Eric. And they say, I have a three year old Fox 36 and the threads for the axle have been stripped. I was wondering if it's possible to fix it using a helicoil or if I have to buy a new one. Um, well, I would say there is maybe a third way. So why wouldn't you want to fit a helicoil? Having to extrude material from the lower is probably not a great idea um, because although the helicoil itself would be very strong, those soft metal lowers probably aren't the best thing to put that helicoil into. Um, ideal world, I could easily say, oh, buy some new lowers and you know, forget all your problems, but obviously that's really expensive. There was actually a really good suggestion in our comments a while ago with somebody else that was facing a similar problem. And they were saying, why don't you look at SR Suntour's axles? Now, the difference with the, the axle that Suntour used compared to a Fox one is that it actually doesn't use any thread. It uses an expanding wedge on one end to clamp the fork together. So you could remove the thread from your, you know, your crooked lowers and install this axle and hopefully you'll be okay. So um, I'd suggest that, look at those center axles. If not, it's probably a new lower job. Next question is from Harry and they say, I have a 2014 Stump Jumper FSR Comp 29er, which is factory spec. When I bought it, it came with a snapped off rebound dial on the custom Revelation RC3 fork. I want to overhaul the fork, but I'm unsure of how to go about it as the closest service manual is for the 2013 Revelation. Do you have any advice on how I should go about overhauling this fork? Um, firstly, when I think you're mentioning the snapped rebound adjuster, I, sh I am assuming you mean just the external part, which is just a Allen key. So that's not too much problem. And if I remember rightly, these forks are the ones with the kind of the hollow legs and they're almost on stilts and the foot nuts are, are recessed quite deeply within the lower. So what you want to do is undo those bolts as normal. And ideally, if you can use like a, a socket extension with a five mil Allen key on the end and just tap it through to loosen them. And then the service is just as normal. Um, as far as I'm aware, the 2014 and the 2013 Revelation were the same. They both just use a motion control damper and the same air spring. So yeah, you should be okay. There might be some small kind of cosmetic changes, but nothing really important. I would worry about too much. In regards to, I think the custom tag, maybe that's something that Specialized put on there. Sometimes, you know, when bike manufacturers are specking a component, they'll often say it's custom because it might have, you know, a slightly different, you know, um, configuration on the internals of the fork, 
but it's not going to be completely differently to one that's off the shelf. Um, so yeah, I, I think you'd be probably be very adequately able to do the service with the 2013 manual. The next questioner asks, can you put a 27.5 fork on a 26 inch frame? And absolutely. So it will raise the front end a bit, which will in turn raise the bottom bracket height a bit, but not too much. And in this world of mullet bikes and all that kind of crazy business, people are absolutely doing it. Um, it would also give you the benefit of kind of future-proofing your bike a bit if you wanted to then upgrade the frame at a later point. Um, I know people, people have been doing this for years. Is it perfect? No, but is it rideable? Absolutely. And it will just give you kind of more mud clearance. That's the way I'd look at it. Um, but yeah, a lot of manufacturers now are really cutting back on what 26 inch forks they even make. So you might even have a choice. <laughs> 27.5 forks sounds like a great bet. I'd go for it. Okay, so next question from Objectif. And they say, hi, I've just restarted mountain biking this summer on a nice secondhand S-Works Enduro 2014. A lovely job. My big objective this year, before I get to 30, is to do the mega avalanche. Do you have any suggestions about specific preps to do to the bike? Mainly, my roval carbon wheels seem problematic, even on smooth terrain, and I tend to bend or break a lot of spokes. Is it a good idea to downgrade to recent stronger aluminium wheels I hear they'd be better in chaotic, rocky, rocky terrain, but I fear I'd lose a lot of snappiness of the bike. Um, so maybe look at your spoke tension to begin with. If you're constantly braking, you know, bending spokes, then I would say something's probably up with that. Um, if spokes are braking a lot, sometimes it can be an indicator that the spoke tension is just too high. Um, and if you are constantly breaking stuff, it doesn't seem like too much of a downgrade to your wheels to go to something alloy. Um, I would look at this as an opportunity to just have two wheel sets that can lend themselves to the task at hand. I'd probably put some lighter tires on my carbon wheels and use them for more cross country-esque riding. And then I'd probably put some burly tires on an alloy rim set and have something that, yeah, is maybe a bit better at managing the big hits. As we talked about earlier on, carbon can, under extreme circumstances, break due to impact. So, yeah, it might not be best if you already do have worries about these wheels to send them down the Meg Avalanche. But alloy can also be damaged via impact. So what I'd suggest is using some double down or double down plus tires, maybe even downhill tires, and a Kushko. And I'd leave that set up all the year round. If you're doing the uplift days, they can be great. Yes, they'll roll slower. Yes, they'll be heavier, but they will give more grip, more protection. And sometimes, but with that thicker, um, thicker sidewall, they can actually really give a better feel on the trail as well. It's, you know, almost like the damping is far superior. So um, yeah, it's definitely worth getting a set, second set of alloy rims if you can afford it. Um, real luxury, but it's lovely to have two sets of wheels with their specific task in mind. The last question is from Renfu, and they ask, why exactly don't you guys do reviews? It would be a great addition. Well, yes, you're right. We do not do reviews. We have never done reviews. A lot of people think we do reviews, but we do not. Um, we just give you the clear, you know, objective information and let you make up your own mind. Now, if you're curious and you want to see our full editorial policy, you can check it out on our website. Um, but essentially, it comes down to what I said. We just give you the facts and let you decide. We're not here to, you know, kind of give too much conjecture about what things could possibly mean or what they might suggest. We just tell you the facts and, um, and let you make a better educated choice. And there we have it, guys. Another week, Ask GMBN Tech, all wrapped up. If you've got your questions, please do get in the comments below and hopefully we can do them some justice. Now, if you want to stay with the channel, click up there for a factory tour of USE exposure with the old Dodster and click down here as we find out what the heck are parameters and what are they all about. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. Cheers, guys.